Okay, let's go to our Bible lesson. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. Hebrews 5. <clears throat> Hebrews 5, <coughs> excuse me, we read and commented on the first six verses last time. Let's continue with verses 7, 8, and 9. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard and that he feared, though he were a son, Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Back in chapters 3 and 4, <clears throat> we discussed the difficulty uh, many Bible expositors have in interpretation by not discerning the four different rests that are introduced in those chapters. And they end up believing that your salvation can be in jeopardy if you do not hold out until the end. And they end up uh, having difficulty. And uh, I, I hope that we separated those four sufficiently to understand the New Testament believer's position of eternal security. Um, the opposite of eternal security is always eternal insecurity. Maybe I and not saved after all. Maybe I lost it. Maybe there's something more I have to do to make sure of it. Maybe I have to speak in tongues. Maybe I have to have this experience to be sure that I'm saved. It's funny, those people who believe in all of these extra things on top of being born again, speak in tongues, and maybe be slain in the spirit, or, or who knows whatever else they might want to add to get baptized by a certain formula. Those are the people who also believe you can lose your salvation. They seem that they they want to maintain that they have so much more than us Baptists, uh, and yet there's those are the ones who think they can lose it very easily through sin or disobedience of some sort. Uh, I believe once God saved me, there's nothing I can do to lose it. Uh, but I'm saved. You and I are saved permanently right now. Praise God. Uh, and here in this section of chapter five. The scholars and the popular preachers also have difficulty. Verse 7 says, Who in the days of his flesh, and the reference is to Christ, just like Isaiah 53 is a reference to Christ, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. And the commentators then run to the scene in Gethsemane, uh, for a, a cross-reference. So let me have you run back there. First of all, go to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. And notice there, verses 35 and 36. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed, that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not that I will, but what thou wilt. And then also Luke chapter 22. Luke 22. Luke 22 and verses 41 through 43. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. The scholars interpret the cup um, as being Christ's premature death in the garden before he could get to Calvary. And uh, he prayed that he wouldn't die at the hand of the devil before he did what he was supposed to do. This is how they approach 
that subject there in uh, Hebrews 5 verse 7. Um, and thus they maintain that Christ's prayer was miraculously answered in the garden. But let's compare scripture with scripture and see if they're right. Turn back to Jeremiah 25. <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 25. You know what goes on in a lot of places? The Southern Baptist uh, Convention was notorious for this. And I, I witnessed it firsthand many years ago when I was a Bible student. Um, we visited a Southern Baptist church, I and some other students, and uh, we sat in one of their adult Sunday school classes. And all they did was they went around the room, everybody would read a verse, and said, now what do you think it means? What do you think it means? What does it say to you? And that's not the right way to study the Bible. You don't just read a verse and say, now, let me see, what, is that, what do I think that means? This is how so many people approach the Bible. They don't know the idea that what you ought to do is compare that verse with another verse and another verse and um, see the, the whole Bible's teaching on the subject. And like I said, in church, that becomes a Bible doctrine on that given topic. Jeremiah 25 and notice verses 4 through 7. And the Lord hath sent me unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, Turn ye again now every one from his evil way, and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them, and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands, and I will do you no hurt. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Jump down to verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at mine hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me. Uh, to wit, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof to make them a desolation and astonishment and hissing and a curse as it is this day. Then he lists other nations, including Egypt, over to Arabia. It doesn't mean that Jeremiah went to all of those places, but uh, the message was intended for all of them as well. You know, word of mouth carries the, the word of God uh, sufficiently. And look at verse um, 26. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth, and the king of Shishak shall drink after them. Go also to the book of Psalms. Psalm 75. Psalm 75. Uh, notice there verses 7 and 8. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. The cup was not a premature death in the Garden of Gethsemane, but the cup was the wrath of God to be poured out upon sin. That was the cup. And that's the cup he prayed to avoid if there was some other way to accomplish what God wanted to accomplish. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, Christ prayed. So we can say that the cup did not pass from Christ. Uh, Christ had to drink it. We read in John 18, verse 11, you don't need to turn. After his agonizing in the garden, uh, then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. 
the cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Therefore his prayer was not answered, or at least the answer at that time was no. I don't know that the Lord Jesus would ever have an unanswered prayer, because they said, I do always those things which please my Father. But in that case, the answer was no. That was his flesh. For in the days of his flesh, the Bible says. So the flesh suffered. The flesh was weak. The flesh succumbed to every other pain that uh, everyone else's uh, flesh uh, is subject to. Besides, the devil couldn't have taken Christ's life from him if he tried to do so. He said in John 10, verse 18, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Now pay close attention to the verse before us, verse 7. <clears throat> With strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard, and that he feared. The verse doesn't say to save him from dying, but rather to save him from death. Uh, those are two separate words. One is an adjective describing the approach to death. It's coming near. The other is a um, noun describing the state of being dead. And uh, in that, Christ was spared. We believe Christ came back to life again, don't we? And uh, he rose again from the dead. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. That's old English meaning held down or held back by it. Held back by what? By death. King David was one of the greatest uh, precursors of the Lord Jesus in the Bible. Prophesied about this very thing. Go back to Psalm 18. Psalm 18. Psalm 18 and one verse there, verse 5. He writes, The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Psalm 18, verse 6 says, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Our text says, in that he heard. Um, and Psalm 21. Psalm 21, verse 4. He asked the life of thee, and thou gavest it him, even length of days, forever and ever. Psalm 49. Psalm 49, uh, verse 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me, say long. And Psalm 69. Psalm 69, uh, verse 3. I am weary of my crying, my throat is dried, my eyes fail while I wait for my God. The Bible says strong crying and tears the Lord Jesus shed for the sake of uh, God's work and the sake of sinners. We saying death cannot keep his prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away, right? Jesus my Lord. Revelation 1 verse 8 says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Christ wasn't spared from dying, but he was, uh, but from staying dead. Notice back here in Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews 2 and verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And uh, the cup, 
was the wrath of God upon sin. All sin. For all sinners. Um, and Christ drank it. The Bible says Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone, everyone that hangeth on a tree. Galatians 3, verse 13. Uh, verse 8, back in our text, Hebrews 5, verse 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Here, Christ is called a son in order to identify him with us. Look at chapter 2, uh, again, verse 10. For it became him, for whom are all things, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And he's going to bring men to glory from a, a flesh and blood condition. Look at chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. In order to do that, and to be justified in all things, the Lord Jesus had to become a man like you and I. And he had to become human like us. Uh, Christ was perfect, but that perfection needed to be tested. We've talked about this before. God can't say to you, I understand what you're going through, if he's never gone through anything. How can he rightly say that to you when you pray to him and cry out for help? But through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, he can say that. He can say, I know what it is to be forsaken. I know what it is to be hungry, to be cold, uh, to be mocked, to be spat upon and ridiculed. I know what it is to um, be tired and weary. I know what it is to die and to be tortured and made bloody in front of a jeering spectacle, a, a jeering crowd of people. I know what it is to be taunted, to be uh, abandoned by my closest friends and, and uh, forsaken and by my own family members. Christ can, I understand all of those things. God can say that because Christ went through them. <clears throat> um, Adam was made sinless. There was no, he hadn't sinned when God made him. But when he was tested, he failed. Christ was made sinless. But um, he was victorious Amen. over temptation and over sin. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam's, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, Christ, shall many be made righteous. Romans 5, Amen. verse 19. Verse 8 says, uh, he learned obedience. What would God have to learn? The Bible tells us that God was manifest in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. So what would God have to learn? Um, and yet in order to identify with you, <clears throat> Christ had to become like you, albeit sinless from the get-go. When he was a baby, he cried. When he was a baby, he had to have his diapers changed. The Lord Jesus had to bathe, had to take a bath. And I don't know if they brushed their teeth in those days, but he had to brush his teeth. Um, I'm certain his uh, earthly parents, uh, Mary and Joseph, probably had to tell him, now, Jesus, don't put that in your mouth. They probably had to say, all right, to say, all right, now it's time to go to bed. You know, in Luke chapter 2, undoubtedly, they were saying, where did that boy go to? They were panicking. They, they were searching for three days looking for him. But um, as a man, he got tired. John chapter 4, he sat down by a well in Sychar to rest. But God doesn't need to rest. Uh, he hungered, <clears throat> he thirsted, <clears throat> but God doesn't. Uh, we read that great verse in chapter 4, verse 15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Thank the Lord. <clears throat> Verse 8 
It says, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. The hymn writer, Paul White, I think, uh, captured this very well, and he says, weary, yet he is the world's only rest. Hungry and thirsty, with plenty has blessed. Tempted, he promises grace for each test. Jesus, wonderful Lord, right? Um, friend of the friendless, betrayed and denied. Help of the meek in Gethsemane, he cried. Light of the world, in gross darkness, he died. So I think he captures it very well. Jesus, wonderful Lord. And uh, verse 9 in our text. He suffered, or he became a man, so that he could identify with you and with me. Verse 9 in our text. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. It says he became the author, or it says in being made perfect, that is his perfection had been tested and confirmed. He became the author of temporary salvation? No, but of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Eternal salvation. I don't know how many times I've talked to people who say that they're Christians, they say that they're believers, they, they give me a you know, flimsy, good enough testimony, I suppose they, they have prayed and asked Christ to save them at some point, but they have no assurance of their salvation. They seem to keep thinking that there's something they have to do to be sure of it, to make certain of it, or to confirm it, or to, to nail it down, to make sure that the, it doesn't go away. They have to join a church, or they have to get baptized the right way, or they have to, uh, you know, the Mormons say you got to wear special undergarments to show your identity with God. Um, and the JWs, they, they're hung up on the name of, the name of Jehovah. The Seventh-day Adventists, they're worried about which day of the week you worship on. The Church of Christ, um, they think that uh, that's the only name that Christians ought to be go ought to go by, the Church of Christ. And yet, you won't find you will not find the phrase the Church of Christ anywhere in the New Testament. Look for it; you'll find the phrase the Churches of Christ in the Book of Romans but you won't find the, the title, The Church of Christ, anywhere in the New Testament. And yet they've made a whole uh, denomination of sorts out of it, and more like a cult, because they think somehow when you get baptized uh, by a Church of Christ elder in their, wa in their water, somehow the, the saving power of the blood of Christ is applied to your soul by that process. And... Anybody that puts so much emphasis on water baptism, years ago there was a Southern Baptist church over on Mountain Avenue, right across the street from my job. This was years before I met Pastor Kim. And, you know, I didn't know what the Lord wanted me to do, if he wanted me to stay here or he'd open up a door. And they were needing a new pastor, and we went there three Sundays in a row, and they wanted me to preach for them. And they seemed to like me, like my, my family. And then they told me that uh, in order for me to become a uh, become their pastor, I would have to get baptized again as a Southern Baptist. <coughs> and, uh, and then we had a Southern Baptist minister that was coming to my job to do funerals, and I told him about this. He said, "Well, you know, uh, churches want to receive members of, you know, if you want to be a member of that church, you become a member the way they receive members." And um, that's their right, that's their prerogative. And I suppose he was right, but then I said, you know, it just seems to me that uh, they're putting more emphasis on water baptism than the scriptures do. Yeah. And so I didn't, uh, I didn't go any further with that group. But, you know, people get hung up on water baptism. Like water baptism is some sort of magical formula, some magical process that's going to save you or make you extra saved. It doesn't save anybody. 
All it is is a testimony that you have been saved. And um, <clears throat> so I, but, but people think all of these extra things are, are part of being truly born again. They're not. Brother Everett and I were talking not long ago about, you know, we, we, we try to explain the essence of what we preach and what we teach from the Bible, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, he rose again from the dead, he was God in the flesh, dying as a substitute for the sinner. And yet, if some guy got hit by a car and he's laying in the intersection while someone calls 911, we're waiting for the ambulance to show up. You don't know how much time he's got. You're going to run through all of those points and say, do you believe this, believe that, believe that, the other, and try to make sure he understands the outline? Right. He can't do that. But is it possible for him to cry out to God, God, I need help, save me. And God will save him? You better believe it's possible. <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> I think I told you about this Vietnamese lady I met, she was telling me how she and her husband were in an accident two and a half years ago. The car rolled off the 15 on their way back from Las Vegas. And um, her husband was killed right away. And she was banged up and all kinds of injuries and was just lingering there half conscious. And before the <clears throat> highway patrol and the paramedics ever arrived, other cars were stopping on the freeway. And she told me there was this this, uh, these people that were Christians and they were trying to talk to me and ask me uh, if I believed in Jesus and, and of course she was describing it as best as she could but I knew what she was describing. Someone was trying to witness to her before it was eternally too late for her. And miraculously God spared her and uh, I don't know but maybe she got saved before she said she blacked out and went unconscious again because I've, I've talked to her a few times, and she's just got the sweetest disposition, um, and uh, she's not angry at the world. She, she uh, asked me to pray for her. By the way, I understand that there's some of our church members in Seoul, at Pastor Lee's church, who watch my sermons to try to practice their English online, of course, the joke's on them. My English isn't that good. But this lady said she's talked to some of her friends. She says she calls her friend in Vietnam every night because it's like mid-morning uh, when her friend's time, uh, just to talk to her friends and get caught up to date on what's going on back home. And <coughs> she told them about this minister that's been coming to her restaurant, and me, me, and uh, she, I want you to watch him on YouTube. And uh, so they watched me, I guess. And now she's got them watching my sermons to practice their English in Vietnam. So God can do uh, amazing things. But I don't know, but that lady might have gotten saved. She just needs maybe someone to help her get grounded in the Word of God or to be sure of what she's trusting in. So... Being made perfect, his perfection was tested and it was confirmed. He became the author of, of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That obey him in the church age is going to have to be by faith. Go back, if you will, to Romans chapter 16. Let's edit this out because I'm about to sneeze, I think. Or maybe not. Romans 16. I notice there verses 26 and 27. But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations, for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And I'll also go back to Romans 6, verse 17. Romans 6, 
Romans 6, notice verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Watch it. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. From the heart. That's a matter of inward faith. That's how a sinner obeys the Lord Jesus Christ, that obeys the gospel. He believes with his heart. Uh, a great transaction takes place between you and the Lord Jesus when you uh, can call upon God as a sinner and say, God, I need what you can do for me. I can't do it on my own. I need only what you only can do. I need help. I don't know how to ask. I don't know what to say, but I need your help. God's looking for that sort of Humility. God's looking for that sort of uh, honesty. Someone who's willing to admit that, that there's something wrong with them and they can't manage without God's help and cry out, cries out to God for his help. Uh, that person's in a good position. Uh, God's going to, God wants to respond. God looks for that sort of attitude. And uh, so it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of the heart. Great transaction takes place. You go from sinner to saint that quickly. Think of, try to wrap your mind around that. It's a, sort of a, a cosmic, a metaphysical uh, thing to consider that you go from being a sinner headed for hell. Suddenly, you're a saint now destined for heaven. And, and that quickly... You have been raised up and are now sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All of those things happen in a moment, in an instant. They happen so quickly that it takes you the rest of your life as a Christian to read the Bible and, and understand what just happened. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing to sense that you're saved and that there's great things waiting for you that God has made you something that you couldn't make yourself. God has prepared a future for you that you couldn't have imagined if you tried. The next time you get to talking to a cult, a cult member, I'll bring this to a conclusion for right now. Say, listen, when I understood I was a sinner, I didn't know everything there is to know about the Bible. I don't suppose anybody knows the entire Bible perfectly. But I knew that I was a sinner. I needed God's help. And I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. And um, in the most wonderful way, I suddenly began to have peace in my heart about my life, about my future. I sensed that my sins were forgiven. God had, my name's recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, and it can never be removed. God promises to raise me up from the dead one day and give me a glorified form like the uh, incorruptible Son of God. There's a mansion in heaven already prepared for me. The Bible says God has raised me up and made me sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus with him right now. So when I pray, it doesn't take a 100,000 light years from my prayer to travel from here to the third heaven. I'm already there. I'm joined with the Holy Spirit of God and he fills the universe. And there's part of me that's always in communion and uh, in fellowship with Jesus Christ. When I read the Bible, it's not a closed book to me anymore. God begins to speak to me and reveals himself to me. You go through all of those things and then ask the cult member, no, what do you have to offer me that's better than any of that? You see, there's, we talk about planting seed we mentioned our church hour. And it occurred to me a couple of years ago, there is such a thing as planting seeds of doubt. You want to plant a seed of doubt in what the other person is trusting in. Get him to realize that what he's hoping in, you know, a celestial marriage in a temple with special underwear, uh, that, has, that can't stand up to you being glorified like the eternal Son of God. Traverse the universe uh, in a split second, I mean, what's the big rage these days? Um, superheroes, you know, DC Comics and Marvel and all of that. They're bulletproof or they're, you know, untouchable for 
<coughs> excuse me, edit that out if you will, please, for a number of reasons, and yet one day you're going to be immortal, incorruptible, invincible, indestructible, uh, like the glorified uh, Lord Jesus Christ, and that's just to get started. Those are just things to get started with. 